true and falsely Jesus in the Bible Part 4. 7 Matthew 28 19. Jesus said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Mark 16 15 Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Also, in Luke 24 47, Jesus said to his disciples, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Is it not clear here that Christ's message should extend over the whole earth and to all the nations, all the ethnic groups on the globe? Actually, this is but another example of the confusion that resulted from fallible human efforts to produce the Gospels of Jesus' behalf. Devoid of inspiration and personal eyewitness, anonymous authors appeared 30-60 years after the ascension of Jesus to put their words in his mouth, basing their testimony on uncertain narrations, rumors and hearsay, and copying from each other and others' writings. The proofs for all of this are as follows. 1. Scholars doubt the authenticity of Mark 16:15 and all the additional verses that end the Gospel, from Mark 16:9 to Mark 16. 20. Because both the syntax and style argue strongly that they were written by someone other than Mark. Besides their glaring absence in the earliest gospel manuscripts from the 4th century. The oldest copies of Mark's gospel end at 16 to 8 while the manuscripts used by the King James translators had the much longer ending. 2. Every author claims that those words of Jesus were his last words to his disciples just before his ascension. But each author has reported a totally different statement. 3. The three authors have not even agreed about the place where Jesus has spoken his last words to his disciples nor the scene of his ascension. Matthew has reported that the disciples went to Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. And that Jesus spoke to them at the hill there, 28 16, and he reported nothing about Jesus' ascension. While the original author of Mark ended his gospel stating that Galilee was the suggested meeting place, 167, and he mentioned nothing about the meeting or the ascension. But the author who extended the Gospel of Mark speaks as if the disciples remained at Jerusalem, and Jesus appeared to them there as they were eating. And after he had talked with them, he ascended up to heaven, meaning they saw his ascension, Mark 16 14-19. As for Luke, he gave the scene of Jesus' last speech to his disciples at Jerusalem, 24 33-36, and for his ascension, he has chose Bethany. Then he led them out of the city as far as Bethany, where he lifted up his hands and blessed them. As he was blessing them, he departed from them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshipped him and went back into Jerusalem. 2450-52 If the three authors have disagreed about one of the main facts in the first life of Jesus on earth, the ascension to heaven and every one of them has written according to his thinking regarding the route and the scene of his ascension. It is no surprise also to see every author differing as to the scenario for Jesus sending his disciples to all the nations just prior to his ascension. On the other hand, we see the author of John has reported that Jesus said to his disciples, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. John 20:21. 20, Ascending to all nations is not stated as in the previous three Gospels. Only to where Jesus was sent would the disciples also be sent. And Jesus was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He had never called at any neighboring nation. Furthermore, John has not reported anything about the Ascension. 4. Luke, in his book, Acts of the Apostles, contradicts himself in his Gospel. He already confirmed in the Acts the idea that Jesus never asked his disciples to go to other nations, but they should go only to the Jews. He reported about a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a captain in the Roman army. He was a religious man, he and his whole family worshipped God instead of pagan idols as Romans were accustomed to do. He also did much to help the Jewish poor and was constantly praying to God. This man had a vision informing him that God was pleased with his prayers and charity and that he should send some men to bring Peter to his house to hear from him. Peter, on the other hand, also had a vision of something coming down from heaven that looked like a large sheet containing in it all kind of four-legged beasts as well as birds of the air. A voice instructed him to kill and eat the animals, but Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. The voice said to him, What God has cleansed you must not call common, while Peter was still trying to understand what the vision meant. The Spirit instructed him to get ready and to not hesitate to go with those men who were sent by Cornelius. The following day, Peter arrived in Caesarea where Cornelius was waiting for him together with relatives and close friends. Peter was welcomed and, as he entered the house, he said to the many people gathered. 
you yourselves know very well that a Jew is not allowed by his religion to visit or associate with Gentiles but God has shown me, in a vision, that I must not call any person common or unclean. Acts 10 1-29 This is clear proof that the disciples had no intent in proselytizing to Gentiles, nor did Jesus ever ask them to go to all nations. Cornelius' case was a peculiar one insofar as he, a righteous non-Jew, received guidance from God through a vision. But the exception only proves the rule. It was only this vision which convinced Peter to put aside the Jewish prejudice and speak to the Gentiles who were living amongst the Jews at the same territory. 5. Luke also reported in Acts that some of the followers of Jesus who had become scattered following their persecution and the murder of Stephen went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Taking the message only to the Jews they found there. It was only those followers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene when they had come to Antioch, who took it upon themselves to preach to the Greeks. 11, 19-20 so, the followers of Jesus at Antioch became divided into two camps. The majority who already knew the fact that the message of Jesus was not a universal one, but a local one for the Jews only, and a minority, from Cyprus and Cyrene, who entirely of their own volition went about preaching to both Jew and non-Jew. As for the apostles at the original church in Jerusalem, they had remained unwavering in following their master, Jesus, by limiting their teachings to their fellow Jews. Remember, Jesus had refused to call the Gentiles to the kingdom of God, despite them both living amongst his own community and surrounding his community geographically. There is no report whatsoever of Jesus ever reaching out, so to speak, to the neighboring nations of Assyria, Rome, Greece, Persia or Arabia. Therefore, when the news of Antioch reached the disciples at Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas. When Barnabas arrived at Antioch, he saw how God had blessed the people, was gladdened and urged them all to be faithful and true to Christ, Acts 11 22-23. 6. In the language of the Bible, the world does not always mean the whole world, but the particular nation being spoken about, as has already been seen in Lake 2-1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered all the world here means only the Roman Empire. 7. And there are many other passages still, besides Matthew 15. 24 Wherein Jesus tells his disciples, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the people of Israel, which clearly delineate the ethnic boundaries of Jesus' mission such as, Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Matthew 10 5-6. When they persecute you in one town, run away to another one. I assure you that you will not finish your work in all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Matthew 10 23 Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are by no means the least of the leading cities of Judah, for from you will come a leader who will guide my people Israel. Matthew 2 6 She will have a son and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people, Israel from their sins. Matthew 1 21 He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. John 1 11. Jesus answered, We must go on to the other villages around here, in Palestine, I have to preach in them also because that is why I came. Mark 1 38. Chapter 2. Falsely Jesus. The fake image of Jesus in the New Testament. In three years, Jesus, through his own words and deeds, had painted a true portrait of himself. And, as his life on earth began with controversy, born as he was miraculously through a virgin birth, so to attended in controversy. The Jews, due to their envy, ensured Jesus' portrait became blurred. To that effect, they plotted against him and attempted to kill him. They were afraid that their nation, their fellow Jews, may attach Jesus' true portrait to their hearts. They were plotting to kill him, and God too was plotting but to save him, and God is the best of those who plot. There is no written record by Jesus himself that we can refer to about the mysterious final act of his life on earth. The only available records from Christians are the four Gospels, which were written some 30-60 years after the ascension of Jesus. These Gospels are merely biographical accounts of Jesus, were produced through purely human efforts, fallible endeavors, that relied and composed from narrations, rumors and hearsay, copying from each other's works and the works of others, because their authors were not eyewitnesses. The greatest of those rumors that spread among people that time was the Jews saying in boast we killed Jesus, then was resurrected. But in fact, they killed him not, nor crucified him. Though it so appeared to them. And those who differ in this matter are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge, they follow nothing but conjecture. 
for surely, they killed him not. More discussions about the crucifixion are coming in this chapter. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark tell us that there was no apostle at all being present as an eyewitness that can testify what had happened exactly at Jesus' mysterious final act of his life on earth. Matthew 26:56 and Mark 14:50 both said, Then all the disciples left him and ran away. The author of John tells us that, Jesus already told his disciples that he would hide from them for a little while. And that he would appear again because he would go to heaven. A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. John 16:16. 16, 16. And also predicted the flight of his disciples. Indeed the hour is coming, yes has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. John 16:32. So, if we try to analyze some of what the authors of the Gospels have reported, about the mysterious final part of Jesus' life, we observe the following. 1. All the disciples escaped, fearful of the Jews. Jesus himself had already predicted their escape. The Jews succeeded in spreading the rumor of Jesus' crucifixion among the people and his disciples, all of whom did not know that God had rescued him. Jesus did not give them any details about their rescue, in order to stop the news reaching his enemies, the Jews. But he did give them some allusions to his survival such as, But I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. John 16 22, But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. John 14 19, But I am not alone, because the Father is with me. John 16 32, Be of good cheer, I have defeated the world, the Jews. John 16 33. But he wanted the crying of his disciples and their sadness to occur before the people, so that the Jews would not doubt. Most assuredly I say to you that you cry and weep, but the world, the Jews, will be glad. You will be sad, but your sadness will be turned into gladness. Now you are sad, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and you joy no one will take from you. John 16:20,22. 20, 2. Since the disciples were not present. And since Jesus did not give them any details about his rescue. Therefore, the only explanation they would have when they were told that Jesus was alive, was to believe that he was resurrected. 3. The reaction of the disciples when they heard that Jesus was alive was not to believe in such a thing, Mark 16. 11. And when they saw him, they were terrified, thinking that they were looking at a ghost, Luke 24:37. Meaning, Jesus never told his disciples that he would be killed and that after three days he would rise again. Otherwise, the disciples would have just waited for him expectantly on the third day with joy. It was God's miraculous rescuing of Jesus that made them react the way they did. 4. It seemed, and God knows best, that Jesus was hiding somewhere, either in a cave in one of the mountains, or another place of refuge. During the time between the coming of the troops to arrest him and his first appearance after the event of the crucifixion. A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. John 16:16. 16, 16. The Jews could not go to the place where Jesus was hiding, nor the disciples of Jesus. He challenged the Jews and said to them, You will look for me, but you will not find me, because you cannot go where I will be. John 7. 34, and he also said to them, I am going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go you cannot come. John 8 21. And he said to his disciples, But I tell you now what I told the Jews, you cannot go where I am going. John 13 33. And it also seemed, and God knows best, that the place, where Jesus hid for three days, is the place that he symbolized it as the heart of the earth that is to say, the Jewish heartland. And he likened it to the belly of the great fish where the prophet Jonah remained for three days. He said to the Jews, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12 40. And it also seemed, and God knows best, that Jesus was disguising in his first appearance, after the event of the crucifixion, Sunday. This can be understood from the narration in John 20 14 17 that there was a face to face conversation between Mary Magdalene and Jesus outside the tomb early Sunday morning. She was supposing him to be the gardener. Why could not she recognize either Jesus' shape or his voice? Why was she supposing him to be the gardener? The only answer, if that really happened, is that he was not resurrected in the first place, but that he was perfectly disguised in voice and appearance as a stranger farmer. 
Then, after giving Mary cause to believe he was other than who he really was, Jesus spoke to her with his normal voice, whereupon she recognized him. So she ran towards him to express her excitement and happiness at seeing him, but he stopped her. Luke also reported, 24-13-32, that on that same day, Sunday, Jesus appeared to two of his followers who were traveling on the road to a village called Emmaus. They were talking about the things which had happened as Jesus drew himself near to them and began to accompany them. He asked them about their conversation and they answered him. Approaching the village some seven miles away, Jesus, still unrecognized by his two followers, indicated that he would keep traveling farther. However, the two men invited him for dinner, since it was late and Jesus accepted the invitation. He took some bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to hosts. It was at that precise moment that his two followers recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Why did they not recognize their teacher all the way while they were conversing with him? Because he was perfectly disguised, neither his shape nor his voice was familiar. Jesus' followers only recognized him when he blessed the bread as he was previously known to do. 5. The disguising of Jesus in order to see his disciples, and not giving any details about what and how things occurred, appears to have been for security reasons until he depart from this world. He already prophesied that Peter will deny him three times, Matthew 26 34. Also, we have just read of how he disappeared from the sight of his two followers when they recognized him Luke, 24 31. More details about the crucifixion will follow. 6. This is a remarkable point. If Jesus really had died on the cross and was raised after three days, then it would be a great opportunity for him when he appeared to his disciples to preach to them the doctrine of the atonement and the redemption, and to ask them to preach it to people. But there was nothing of that at all. If all the four authors of the Gospels had reported in full detail some things about Jesus that are not important, why then have they not reported any important teaching from Jesus on his last day on earth concerning his death to save mankind? In his last chance with his disciple, not a word they reported about the Savior who poured his blood on a cross. All they reported was that, before Jesus departed from this earth, he wanted them to make people his disciples, baptize them, obey his commands and preach the gospel and the message of how to repent and forgive, Matthew 28 19-20, Mark 16 15, Lake 24 47, John 20 23. The omission should in reality come as no surprise because there was no death, no resurrection, no atonement and redemption, and nothing of that sort at all. But unfortunately, from this nothingness, a fake image of Jesus was thus painted. The Christ Jesus according to the flesh was Israelites, who is overall, the eternally blessed God. He is the exact likeness of God. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to be equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will he gave up all he had, and took the nature of a servant. He became like man, and appeared in human likeness. So he is the visible likeness of the invisible God. But he is the man Christ Jesus, the mediator between God and men. As to his humanity, he was born of the seed of David, and declared to be the sons of God with power, according to his divine holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. He was the spiritual rock that went with Moses and his people to drink from it. When the right time finally came, God sent his own son, born of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law. But God did not compassionate for his own son, he delivered him to redeem those who were under the law. Because God's way now of putting people right with himself has been revealed. It has nothing to do with law. God puts people right only through their faith in Jesus, who was offered by God so that by his sacrificial death he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven only through their faith in him who loved us and gave his life for us. Never by doing what the law requires. For if a person is put right with God through the law, would mean that Jesus died for nothing. Jesus became a curse for us because the scripture says, anyone who is banged on a tree is under God's curse. But by becoming a curse, he has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. Because those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse. For the law was introduced in order to increase wrongdoing, but when sin increased, God's grace increased much more. Jesus died for the wicked at the time that God chose to show us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners, Jesus did not take the blood of goats and balls to offer as a sacrifice. Rather he took his own blood and died to obtain eternal salvation for us, because sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son.
because just as all people were made sinners as the result of the disobedience of one man, Adam. In the same way, they will all be put right with God as the result of the obedience of the one man, Jesus. That means, God was making all mankind his friends through Jesus, and he did not keep an account of their sins. And if Jesus has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. And we are shown to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised Jesus from death whom he did not raise. If our hope in Jesus is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in the world. So if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from death, you will be saved. This includes everyone, because there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, God is the same Lord of all. For Jesus will come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And those who have died believing in Jesus will rise to life first, then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. And so we will always be with him. So then encourage one another with these words. Deconstructing this fake image of Jesus. By a personal initiative, and an invented lie, Satan has helped him at it. A falsifier has painted this fake painting of Jesus. It gives a horrible conception of both God and Jesus. It shocks anyone with an innate, sound mind and sound heart. The attributes of God in this part of the New Testament is a contrast to the attributes of God in the Old Testament and his attributes in the four Gospels in addition to Jesus also being distorted into a paganized mold. However, upon careful examination for this painting, that does not contain even one word from Jesus' words at all, we notice the following. 1. This falsifier was the first corrupter of the reality of Jesus. He even showed him in a mix of different images, such as. He was overall, the eternally blessed God, he was the exact likeness of God, he had the nature of God, but he did not think that he should try to be equal with God, he gave up all he had. And became like man, appeared in human form and took the nature of a servant, he is the visible likeness of the invisible God, but he is the man Christ Jesus, the mediator between God and men. He was declared to be the sons of God with power, according to his divine holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. All these different images of Jesus were new inventions. They were originated from the inventor himself. He also corrupted the Hebrew term son of God from meaning a chosen person near to God to a distinct deity alongside God, just as a real father and a real son sitting beside one another. This conception of Jesus raises several inescapable questions, how many gods are there? Is it one for the sake of monotheism? Or two gods, one a greater father God and the other is lesser son God besides his father? Is this really what is in the mind of a common Christian, just as with a common pagan idolater? It is just a confused dogma that can more accurately be coined as monopoly theism. Jesus was not responsible for such a confused dogma. He never preached such polytheistic pagan-like mythology. Jesus himself, his disciples, the original followers of Jesus and the successors to the apostles of Jesus, none of them ever preached a heavenly divine Jesus. None of the words of Jesus that were recorded in the four Gospels spell out divinity for him in any way, shape or form. Instead, Jesus' words only ever portrayed him as purely human messenger to the house of Israel. So, Jesus was betrayed twice. The first time by Judas who was inspired by Satan to betray his teacher. The second by this falsifier who was also inspired by Satan to betray the original teaching of Jesus. He succeeded to present of a fake Jesus and lead people away from the truth of the genuine one into his own false theology. So, if the painting of Jesus that you are hanging in your heart is the fake one of that falsifier, you already have associated Jesus with God and his divinity. And this is the worst sin that God never forgives, if you die upon it. So please, start to seek the genuine Jesus. It will lead you to the way to salvation. 2. Another deceiving mythology, invented by this falsifier, was the theology of the atonement and redemption. It is the idea of a sacrificed Savior, and the blood of a transformed Savior washing away sins and granting eternal life. This mythology was originated neither from Jesus, nor from his disciples, but from this falsifier himself. It was entirely his own invention. Never was it based upon any divine revelation. He was influenced by the similar mixture of many cultures, and the ancient pagan religion of the god Mithras in the city of his birth, Tarsus. He borrowed the pagan theology of the atonement and redemption from this pagan Mithraism, one of the most popular religions of the Roman Empire in the first century.
he made it the backbone for his philosophy and marketed it in the pagan world of Gentiles. This Mithras was the son of the pagan god who saved the world by sacrificing a bull, and through its blood the world was purified. He was called a mediator. So it was that this falsifier borrowed this idea of purification by blood from Mithraism and then applied it to Christianity, claiming that sins are forgiven only through blood sacrifice. He took Mithraism up a step, from a sacrificial bull to a sacrificial man-god, representing a real son for God. This son was the exact likeness of God and had God's nature, and called by him a mediator too. While God the Father was a cruel father who, in order to have mercy on humanity and save the world, had to sacrifice his son without mercy. The problem that this falsifier brought to Christianity is this. How many gods are there? Is it only one god? If so, did he just kill himself, suicide? This mythology suggests that Almighty God cannot forgive the sins of Adam unless he commits suicide, after he chooses to come down to earth to offer himself to be killed on the cross and taste death. So, God corrected a mistake, Adam, eating from the forbidden tree, with an even greater mistake, killing himself, suicide. Glory be to God above all what they ascribe to him. Or were there more than one God, just as the pagans believe? Father and his son, the one to be sacrificed for the sake of humanity, as is Mithras the son of the pagans God, who had killed a bull to save the world. Any way you look at it, there is a problem. If one God, it would be considered that he committed suicide. If two gods, it is a polytheism creed. If Jesus was just a human prophet, how could a mere human wash away sins and grant eternal life? The answer is that God already had rescued Jesus from death, and raised him into heaven, 